Thank you, William. Thank each of you for coming. It's a pleasure to be with you. And I enjoyed myself last time, and uh, I know that I'm going to enjoy myself again. I already have with Myron's speech, so I appreciate him very much. It's really a grand blessing to be able to be anywhere where you are not fettered and your conscience isn't stamped down because you know that if you say certain things, there's just going to be an explosion in the room. <laughs> and I'm so thankful for you. And I'm thankful to a great God in heaven who's allowed us through his providence to come and to see his truth more clearly. Amen. And I'm thankful also for the process that I went through, which was very uh, hard and gave me a great deal of consternation because it made me appreciate what was on the other side. And to tell you the truth, I was concerned somewhat of preterism for years. I almost kept myself from studying it. I had thought that one of the consequences of going in this direction was full universalism. I thought that might be a consequence. I wasn't sure. And that's one of the things that kept me from seeing the truth. I don't believe that preterism implies universalism, but one thing I learned from my journey is that wherever the truth leads, go. If God puts you in a particular place, go. And uh, then live with the consequences of your decision. And what I have discovered is that I haven't really changed any of my fundamental beliefs. That, in fact, I believe that there's a a church that Jesus established, that we're to repent and be baptized today, that we're to partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. But what I do believe now is that for in covenant, individuals who are now in relationship with Christ, death is destroyed for them. And there's plenty of grace for someone to grow in his knowledge and in his favor so that he can sustain his relationship with God. For God has ordained a system where we're bound to make it. We've created doctrines where individuals are bound to lose their salvation. And so for me, this has been a liberating, liberating teaching, and I'm so thankful to be able to be here this morning. So we're going to deal with Daniel chapter 7 this morning. If you have your Bibles, you can open to that particular text of the Old Testament. I think it's a very significant, important Old Testament text because we find that the coming of the kingdom is spoken about by Daniel, but also the coming of the Son of Man. Now we're going to do some exegesis from all of the passage, but I want to highlight a passage as we begin. Notice in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Now, this is a significant passage because Jesus is coming in the clouds. Now, when Jesus walked the earth, and when he began to speak about his coming, and he used that same appellation, that same designation, Son of Man, invariably, he's talking about this text. So in Matthew chapter 24, in the great Olivet Discourse, in verse 30, where Jesus said, They shall see the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He was referencing this text. And when Jesus was standing before the Sanhedrin and the high priest in Matthew 26 and verse 64, and he said, Hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, coming in the clouds of heaven. You remember the response of the high priest? He rent his clothes, something which the high priest was never to do. But in his anger and in his consternation against Christ, he ripped his clothing apart because he full well knew what Jesus was saying. That in fact, he is the one who is coming in judgment. He was coming in the clouds. And in fact, they would be the recipients of God's own judgment. And so this is an important text, a significant text. One of the most important things that we need to learn as we study the Bible is that the relationship between the Old and the New Testament is like a hand in a glove. It's a type and an antitype. 
What God is doing in the Old Testament is demonstrating the foundation from which all New Testament eschatology would find itself fulfilled. And so we have a marvelous relationship that exists between the old and the new. And we need to remember Jesus' specific statement that not one jot or tittle should fail of the, wall, uh, of the law till all would be fulfilled. And he was speaking about the law and the prophets in that context. And so not only does the law have to be fulfilled, but the prophets have to be fulfilled as well, or we're, we're still under the law and the prophets. Now once we understand the timing of an event, we have a better understanding of the nature of the event. We'll be talking about those kind of things during the seminar. But Jesus clearly stated when the kingdom would come. In the Olivet Discourse, in Luke's account, in Luke 21, 31, Jesus said, And when you see these things come to pass, know ye the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. And again, as Myron said, at hand cannot be projected for thousands and thousands of years. And we have at hand, meaning imminent, when those things would take place. And so here we find a coming kingdom. Now, let's go back and see if we can unpack some of the verses here in Daniel chapter 7 and do a little bit of exegesis. Notice now, please, in verse 1 of Daniel chapter 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the dreams. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, behold, four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. Now when we have Hebraic symbolism, generally the sea has reference to the Jewish mind to the Mediterranean Sea. The land would have reference to Palestine. Outside of Palestine, the Gentile forces would come against the land. That's the significance of the sea beast in Revelation chapter 13. But here we find the great sea, no doubt, having reference to Gentile forces. Uh, we'll talk about Isaiah chapter 60 later in one of my other speeches, where we find that the sea one day would be converted. Well, God is not going to convert the H2O but he was going to convert the Gentiles so that they would have equal standing for the Jews. So from Jewish perspective, when you have the earth, you have the land, you have Dan to Beersheba. And by the way, Palestine is about 180 miles long, north to south. In your Bibles, in Roman, uh, Revelation 14 and verse 20, the Bible speaks about 1,600 furlongs. Well, depending on the exact measurement of the ancient Roman mile and the furlong, we have about 180 miles. Dan to Beersheba, the concept of where the northern people would dwell and the southern people would dwell. That's the land. That's the earth. From the Jewish perspective, it's where they live. And the sea is where the Gentiles would come from. And so we find Daniel in Babylonian captivity using Jewish language about the sea. And so we're talking about Gentile forces. Now Daniel had earlier an interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. You remember? He saw this image with a head of gold, with breast and arms of silver, belly and thigh of brass, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay, partly strong, partly broken. What Daniel is doing is not giving another prophecy about another series of events. He's simply talking about the same event from a different perspective. It is Hebrew parallelism. The Jews were wont to talk about the same subject in different perspectives. And so the disciples in Matthew 24 ask about when shall these things be when Jesus spoke about the temple, stones being thrown down, and about the sign of thy coming and the end of the age and the end of the world. They weren't referencing different matters. They're referencing the same matter. In the great revelation, we find that the seven seals introduce the seven trumpets, which in fact set the stage for the seven plagues. They are not different events. They are the same event. It's Hebrew parallelism. And Daniel chapter 2 is Daniel chapter 7, explained in Daniel chapter 8, reiterated in Daniel 9, and clarified in Daniel 12. It's not about different subjects. It's all about the same subject. And so we find the great sea, and the first beast is like a lion. Verse 4, and it had eagle's wings. 
Well, we go back to the imagery of Daniel chapter 2 and the head of gold is that first empire that Daniel had prophesied about. And in Daniel 2 and verse 37, we find that Daniel said, Nebuchadnezzar, thou art this head of gold. And so we have an inspired interpretation of the dream that he's speaking about the Babylonian empire. Now, in Daniel chapter 8, verses 20 and 21, we find that the ram which thou sawest of the two horns of the kings are Media and Persia, speaking about that second kingdom. And here's the third kingdom. The rough goat is the king of Grecia, referencing uh, Alexander the Great, who's the first of the kings of the Grecian Empire. So what Daniel is chronicling is the dominion of these empires that actually persecute and dominate God's own kingdom. And so they're persecuting powers and they have dominion over God's people. And the first one was Babylonian in its nature. Verse 4. Now notice the latter part of verse 4. And it was lifted up from the earth and made stand from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. You remember Nebuchadnezzar's heart was lifted up high and he believed that he was the great ruler of the world. And God came to him and said seven times to pass over you until you know the most high rules, rules in the kingdom of men. And about that same time, the Bible says, that Nebuchadnezzar was given some foreign spirit. And he had lost uh, accounting of himself. And he went out for seven years and he grew his fingernails and his hair and he ate uh, grass like an oxen. And finally when he came to himself, he recognized that he wasn't the great ruler. It's the most high that rules in the kingdom of men. And so that first empire is the Babylonian empire. The second, as we already proved, is the Mede and the Persians. Look at verse 5. Behold, another beast, a second like unto a bear. It raised itself uh, on one side. It had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said, Thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. Well, the bear is likened unto the breast of arms and silver, uh, the breast and arms of silver. It is the Mede and Persian Empire. And the Bible says it had three ribs in the mouth, it between the teeth of it. Now that three is repeated three times in our text. We find in verse 8, the little horn had three of the first horns plucked up behind it. And then in verses 24 and 25, we have that after the ten horns rule, one comes after them, which is diverse from the first. He's going to subdue the three kings. And so what we have is that the dominating power has been acquired by the present power spoken about. So those who are now persecuting have acquired the powers that the others had delegated to them. So the persecuting power now has dominion over the kingdom of God. And so that's the second kingdom. Look at verse 6 of Daniel chapter 7. And after this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four winds of a fowl. Beast also had four heads. Dominion was given to it. And so again, this is Alexander the Great. In Daniel chapter 8, verse 21, we have the reference to that specific kingdom. It was very quick and very swift and very powerful, like a leopard. Now notice in verse 7, And after this I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly. It had great iron teeth that devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts and were before it, and it had ten horns. Now, of course, this is the fourth world empire. It is Rome. And no doubt, when we think of the Roman Empire, we notice that, in fact, it was a great and powerful empire, and it did persecute God's people. And yet, there's a mention of ten horns, which many have suggested Point, pointing to the first ten kings of the Roman Empire from Julius Caesar. I'm not so sure. Because it seems to me that the image in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7 have to fit. Now, the Roman Empire stretches to about 376 B.C. But everything's coming to a halt with the kingdom of God. Now, Rome has the legs of iron, and the feet of iron of clay, 
and the ten kings, perhaps the ten toes. Now, if it's the case we're talking about dominion and persecuting power, who would give the Jews the persecuting power to persecute the church? But Rome. Now, I want you to simply consider, I'm like Don on this particular matter, this is my AT&T position at this present time. I'm certainly given to study, and if you've got a criticism of the position, I'm willing certainly to take it. But open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 17, please. And we want to notice something here. And of course, we have argued from verse 10, those of us who are preterists for a while, had argued that the one is, has to be Nero, which dates the book uh, before 68, before uh, his demise. But we find here this beast has seven heads, verse 9, and seven mountains on, the woman, uh, on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh he must continue for a short space. And the beast that was and is not, he is the eighth, and he is the seventh of golden perdition, and the ten horns which thou sawest are the ten kings. Now notice, it appears to me we have seven seven Roman kings. It appears to me that we have ten kings who were delegated authority by the Romans. And if that's the case, these ten are Jewish in their nature. Now I want you to notice in Revelation 17, 18, And the woman which thou sawest is the great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth or land. When you see in the book of Revelation the word earth from the Greek word ge, it almost always has reference to the land of Palestine, the kings, the rulers of the land. Now we know from Jewish history that in fact it was Rome that gave Jews the legal right to exist and to practice their religion. Do you remember in John chapter 11 when the Pharisees and the high priests were speaking and they were talking about Christ and they said about Jesus, if we leave him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans will come and take our place. What was their place? Their place of authority. They knew it was delegated by the powers of Rome, and our, uh, our place, and our power, and our land, and our station. They would come and take away their nation. So the Jewish leaders knew which side their bread was buttered on, so to speak. And whenever possible, the Jews hated Christ to the degree, and those that followed him, that they would side with Rome before they would side with Jewish law. Do you remember in John 19, verse 15, almost unconscionably, the Jewish leaders said, we have no king but Caesar. It was anathema for a Jew to say, and yet they were using the Jewish authorities to persecute the church. And Rome also, in order to please the Jews, would encourage the persecution. Do you remember the time in Acts chapter 24 and 27 where Felix left Paul bound in order to give pleasure to the Jews? And so we have this tandem of persecuting power. We have, in fact, a Roman power and then a delegated Jewish power. Now, I know there's a problem with this because this verse kept me from accepting what I'm telling you today, but there may be a different understanding of the text. Look in Revelation chapter 17. Verse 16. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast shall hate the whore and make her desolate. Well, how are the Jewish kings and the Jewish rulers doing that? They may have hated them in practice. Hated them in, in the fact that they were not doing actually as they had said to go along with the, Rome, or the Romans. You see, the Jewish leaders, Josephus said, the high priests, they understood the significance of the Roman power. The zealots would have nothing of it. And when the zealots had the uprising, it appears to me that the Jewish uh, leaders then would have this antagonism toward the Jews. Now that is my present position on the ten kings. And I think that fits better because there's a transition from the persecuting powers of that sea beast 
then to the land beast, as we're going to talk about in Revelation chapter 13, which I believe is Judaism, and the one who is sitting in the temple of God, and the one who is ordering the strikes against God's people is no one else but the high priest whom Jesus would destroy by the coming and by riding on the clouds of heaven. And that is my position which I will further develop in Revelation chapter 13. But let's continue now to Daniel chapter 7. And so we find a little horn popping up. And the reason I have this position today is because of William Bell. So if he's got a problem with me, I'm going to say, well, I've got a problem with what you told me. <laughs> he is the one that told me that the little horn he thought was Judaism. And see, I thought, no, 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 no. This has to be Nero. Uh-uh. In Revelation chapter 17, I believe there's the Roman authorities, but it doesn't describe the ten kings that also received their authority from the beast. If the little horn is Judaism, and William, I'm not going to say this often to you and publicly, but that was brilliant. That's, that's very good. Very good. Among them a little horn before whom three of the first horns were plucked up. So they acquire the authority to persecute, acquire the authority to dominate. And that little horn, Judaism, I believe, is the high priest sitting in the temple of God, who is ordering the strikes against the people of God. And he's speaking these great things. And in fact, he was speaking those great things. And it appears to me also in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that the high priest would prophesy, as Caiaphas did, that may have explained some of the miracles and the wonders that were being done to deceive the people at the time. Now, notice in verse 9 now of Daniel chapter 7, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like a pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame. His wheels are as burning Fine. Now, the Ancient of Days is not Jesus. It cannot be. Because in verse 13, the Bible says the Son of Man came to the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days must be the Father here. He must be the one who is sitting, who is awaiting for the kingdom to be restored, for that relationship to be restored. And so he sat as a garment white as snow. The hair of his head is pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame. His wheels are burning fire. And fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, and the judgment was set, and the books were opened. Now, I was taught as I was uh, just growing and a new Christian, a uh, beginner in churches of Christ, that verses 13 and 14 have a reference to Pentecost. We have a preacher in the Church of Christ by the name of Foy Wallace. He was one of the great champions. We viewed him who taught against premillennialism in, uh, in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. He and a man by the name of Oliphant in Churches of Christ almost single-handedly rooted out premillennialism, premillennialism from among our ranks. And Brother Wallace took the position that verses 13 and 14 have reference to Pentecost. That's the position I learned in Bible college from men like Roy Deaver and Tom Warren. The problem is that's not the context. And when a New Testament writer quotes from an Old Testament text, they always quote in context. We don't have the authority to take a New Testament text out of context, do we? Why would they have an authority to take an Old Testament text out of context when Jesus is citing Daniel 7, 13 uh, and 14 and Matthew 24, verse 30? This cannot be Pentecost. It is a judgment text. What happens after the persecution of the little horn? The books are open. The judgment is set. That is a picture of Revelation chapter 20, 11, and 12. It's the great judgment scene. It is what Paul referred to in 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. He would judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. I asked my opponent in recent debate, if a physical judgment is in view by Paul, and this is the destruction of the planet, and then we have the judgment of the living and the dead, it seems to me we're all in the same spiritual state. We're either all dead or all living, 
but we're not dead and living at the same time. So he comes back, and I think his moderator, David Brown, gave him the answer of 1 Timothy 5, verse 4. She is dead while she liveth. You remember the widow? So she's dead spiritually while she's living physically. So he's talking about all those who are dead spiritually, who are living physically. That's the nature of the judgment. No, 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 and again, no. It's just wrong-headed. The concept of the dead, the Hadean world judged. The living now by the gospel because God would not judge one man by the gospel until that gospel was fully completed and delivered to all of the world. And isn't that a merciful God? Rather than believing that somehow that everybody was condemned at Pentecost or at the cross, I've got brothers in the church of Christ who believe that at the cross every single person from that point on that didn't hear the gospel was lost to hell and there was no way for them to even hear the gospel. As a matter of fact, the majority of my brothers believe that. That's unconscionable. I believe it's an immoral doctrine. And we need to refute it and demonstrate something of the mercy of God. You remember in, in Acts 13, Paul would come to the Jews and said it was necessary that the gospel be first preached to you. But seeing you put it off from you, you judge yourself. They were judged then. Uh, uh, unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles, where well, they would have an opportunity to respond to the gospel as the gospel was increasing, as the kingdom was increasing. Did not Jesus say that the kingdom of God is likened unto a mustard seed, smallest of all seeds, and then it becomes this great plant, and the birds of the airs would come, and they would uh, live in its branches, a reference to the Gentiles coming in and the kingdom encompassing the whole world. It's a wonderful picture of growth, of a process that God was now destroying death by destroying the old covenant world and giving life to his covenant people, which is what the gospel is all about. But let's go back to our text before I start preaching on something else. <laughs> So now notice in verse 11, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, beheld even till the beast was slain. Now again in Revelation chapter 13 there are two beasts and we're talking about dominating powers that can persecute God's kingdom. I don't think that he's talking here about Rome. I think the beast that's slain here is the land beast that supported the little horn and his body destroyed, given to the burning flame. So that beast and his body are destroyed. Now I'm going to give a lesson in the afternoon from Isaiah chapter 11. But I want to make a little reference right now because I saw a relationship here that I hadn't seen before I studied these texts together. Isaiah 10 is the background, of course, of Isaiah chapter 11. In Isaiah 10 and verse 18, as Israel was punished, they would be punished in body and soul. It was a corporate picture. Brother Glenn, I thought of you. I thought of you when I put these texts together. Because when Jesus said in Matthew 10 verse 28, Fear not them which kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. Fear him who destroy both body and soul in hell. That's a composite picture. It's a composite picture. Isaiah 10, verse 18. Jesus is speaking about old covenant Israel is what he's talking about. Now there might be some argument about the soul and the body there a little bit and what, what continues after. But when you have an Old Testament text cited, and I believe Isaiah 10, 18 is the concept of Matthew 10, 28. You have a covenant. A covenant people destroy both soul and body. So it looks like to me, that's what he's referencing there. And this fits perfectly, in my mind, with the land beast that was slain. Now, verse 12 of Daniel chapter 7, as concerning the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives are prolonged for a season and a time. It appears that he's talking about their persecuting power taken away. Verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and kingdom, 
that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away in his kingdom that shall not be destroyed. Of course, this is Luke 21 and verse 31, but it's also a wonderful explanation of 1 Corinthians 15, 24. The Son of Man is coming to the Ancient of Days. He delivers the kingdom back unto God, not to destroy the kingdom, but to establish the kingdom in its eternal aspect. And now relationship restored. And so that those covenant people are brought into the presence of God. And it is a wonderful, I believe, picture of what Paul is speaking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That in fact the kingdom is restored. And when the disciples asked that question in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, they were not to know the times and the seasons which the Father had put it in His own power because they didn't know the day and the hour. And here it finally had arrived, and the kingdom is completely established. Now notice that all people, nations, and languages should serve Him. And again, that makes perfect sense. As the gospel went out and was preached to all the world, God would not allow that gospel standard to be the judgment of all people until all people had access to it. And so now, because the gospel has went to all of the world, it's to all nations and languages and people. And God has broken down all the racial barriers and all the socioeconomic barriers and all the uh, physical standings that men have built up over the years so that in His kingdom we should have a wonderful unity of individuals who know no racial distinction no cultural distinction, no educational distinction, no social economic distinction, but we are one in Christ. And by the way, in 1 Corinthians, I'm preaching again, I'm going, <laughs> I'm going away from here. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 28. What a wonderful, wonderful text, which tells us what the result of the resurrection would bring. And by the way, um, when, when, you, when you get that text, look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 11, and get 1 Corinthians 15, 28, and you see the, the wonderful harmony here. The Bible says, And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also be subject unto him, that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. That phrase, all in all, connotatively, every time it's used, by implication, in the New Testament, means both Jew and Gentile in one body. He's not talking about substance. He's talking about stance, relationship with God, that when the law was destroyed, that the covenant people were on equal footing, that there was a wonderful unity the two exist after the law was destroyed and the Jewish conscience arguments were no longer there in the church. It was a spiritual kingdom that prevailed. Now notice Colossians chapter 3 and verse 11. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian or Scythian, nor bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. It means that no longer does the church look Jewish, which it looked for 10 to 12 years. And then for a while you would have the Jews who would have these conscience matters because of the law and the law being destroyed for them and some of them trying to bring the Gentiles under the law finally was over. Everything was over. The persecution was over and the kingdom was united and they looked at each other and their world was different. And you sat down with someone of a different race, of a different culture, of a different background and he was your brother. And that's exactly what God came to do. As a matter of fact, the great message is to bring harmony to the people of God. That in Christ, the distinctions are broken down. And so we have this wonderful picture of harmony in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15 and in Colossians 3 as well. well. Let's go back to the text here. We need to uh, hurry. I don't know if I need to hurry. <laughs> um, I probably have to hurry. I got till the top of the hour. Where's William? Top of the hour? Yes, okay. I don't want to take away from Don's uh, time. You won't. <laughs> I appreciate Don. He's a, he's a, there's a preacher for you right there. He's not going to let anybody infringe upon his time. Now, God bless him. He does a wonderful job. By the way, we, don't, we, we, get, we, we get live morning musings this morning with Don coming here in just a little bit. So that's great. That's great. All right. So now... Um, 
Verse 15, let's, let's make some progress through this text here. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all of this. So he told me and made me to know the interpretation of the things. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Again, four empires. He's declaring again the nature of the vision. It's Hebrew parallelism. That's so key to understanding that many times the Jews were want to talk about the same thing from different perspectives, and that's what's happening here. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. And this is a picture of Revelation 11:15, when the kingdoms of this world became the kingdom of our God, and He would reign forever and ever. And so that kingdom would be completely established um, in the... Uh, time when the little horn is destroyed and that beast is destroyed. What well, looks like to me it has to be the land beast. It has to be in order for it all to fit. Rome wasn't destroyed for 376. As a matter of fact, our opponents in preterism, that's where they go. They want to point to, to Rome. Well, we, I think that we're stronger in our argumentation when we talk about the transition from the sea beast, Rome, giving its power to the land beast, Judaism, which would then culminate with the high priest. And by the way, well, no, I'll get to that in a minute. R remind me to speak about the ten high priests if I forget it, okay, <laughs> in verse 24. So we find um, this fourth beast is now stamped, okay? Verse four, then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron, nails of brass, devoured, breaking pieces, stamped the residue of his feet. And one of the ten horns that were in his uh, head, and of the other which came up, before whom three fell, even of that horn had eyes, and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. And again, we're talking about that same kind of head and same kind of horn spoken about earlier in Daniel 7 and verse 8. So he says in verse 21, I beheld in the, in the same horde made war with the saints, prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High in the time um, that the saints possessed the kingdom. This is the time of Revelation 12, 10. Then comes salvation, strength, and the kingdom. It's the time of Revelation, uh, Luke 21, 31. The kingdom was nigh at hand. Revelation 11, 15, 2 Timothy 4, 1, Matthew 16, 27, and 28, the text that Myron spoke about. So that's all that same kingdom. So now notice in verse 23. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from the kingdoms, shall devour the whole earth, land, tread it down, break it in pieces, and the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings. Now, let's see if I have my list. I went on a website the other day for curiosity's sake, and I came across a man by the name of Bruce Gordon. I don't know who he is. But he's done some Jewish research into the Jewish rulers and the high priests uh, from Caiaphas on. Did you know that after Caiaphas, who died in 36, there are ten high priests who rule? Ten of them rule. Theophilus, Simon, Elianus, Ananias, Joseph, Ananus, Joshua, Joshua again, Mattathias, and uh, Ananias. He chronicles these ten. Now from a Jewish perspective, especially in that little time, who would they be concerned in the early church about? but the Jewish persecution led by the high priest for your consideration. So now, look at verse 24, and of the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten that shall arise, another shall rise after them. Now if then you count Caiaphas as first, then you have the last high priest in AD 70 who is destroyed by the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man who's coming. And did not Jesus tell the Sanhedrin and the high priest, you shall see the Son of Man riding in uh, uh, the power of heaven, coming in the clouds of heaven? Matthew 26, 64, didn't he say that? Yes. And they understood exactly what he was saying. 
He was making allusion to Daniel 7, 13, and 14, and he was coming to destroy their power. We're not the enemies that ruled. Many times the rulers of the Jewish land, and didn't they not have the power because the law still remained for them? Yes, it seems, it seems to me that they did. And by the way, look how this fits with 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 8. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 8. Seven and eight, let's read these together. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. I think he's talking about the Jewish princes here. The rulers of the age. Which fits back to the ten kings and those who are ruling in, the, in physical Israel. All right, let's go on and see. We'll, we'll, we'll get through the text here. So verse 25, He shall speak great words against the Most High. He shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Think to change times and laws. Did they not want the law to continue? Did they not want the temple to remain? Would they not, in the Judaizing text, uh, context of false teaching, say the resurrection is past, so they would have no confidence that the law would actually be destroyed? I think so. And shall be given into his hand until a time, times, and a dividing of a time. The time, one, times two. Dividing of a time, one and two, is three, three and a half to three and a half years. The 42 months of Revelation 11, verse 2. That time of great, intense persecution, which would end with his destruction of the little horn and the last one who came after the ten kings. In verse 26, But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume, to destroy it to the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. And what a wonderful message for the kingdom will never ever be destroyed, is which Daniel stated in Daniel 2 and verse 44. And if the kingdom will never be destroyed, then I don't have to worry about the last day, do I? I really don't. Because Jesus said, He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And in fact, we are in this everlasting kingdom today. Now look at verse 28, and then the lesson is yours. Hitherto is the end of the matter, as for me, Daniel, my cogitations much troubled me, and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in heart. You know why? Look at verse 26. And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true, wherefore shut up thou the vision, it shall be for many days, about 500 years in the future. You can't know all about it. It's too difficult for you. It's for many days. And yet, as Myron said in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 10, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And the fulfillment of what Daniel had prophesied was about to come to pass. And God was going to open heaven, and he was going to create a new kind of world in which there were no of, none of the previous distinctions, that all men from all backgrounds, all walks of life, whose heart was given to the Lord, who obeyed the gospel, were members of his kingdom. Thank you.